Campana to attack your father, Lom and not let play in the Edmades to Bantamach, export the man in Yadin and Dolchen Keen, it had Zinta, Agastar and Noe, and made it have false leads in it. Irish women are achieving so much at home and on an international stage at an elite level. Young boys and girls want to be exactly like our female sporting heroes. There's no doubt that female athletes are getting much more recognition than before, but we still have a long road ahead to reach equality and to get the same recognition as our male counterparts. And to talk about this and much more, I'm delighted to be joined by Rob, Lindsay and Cleana. Lindsay, we'll come to you first. You've done it all, you've seen it all, you've represented your country at soccer, basketball, rugby, of course, and you played football with Dublin as well. So take us back. Were you always a sport nut? Um, probably, actually, just the energy and just feeling alive and the group of people on the same goal with the same interests, with the same sport. Um, like got, being in Croker on a, on a field with Dublin fans. Thank you for us beating Cork tonight. I'll put that in. <laughs> um, I don't know how we do against me all, but... Um, do you know, to feel that buzz and the singing and, you know, walk along the streets of Dublin in blue, you know, sky blue and navy jerseys is just a buzz. But I think it feeds back maybe to my, my aunt and my grandfather on my, um, my mum's side. Um, mad Leeds United supporters, mad Liverpool supporters. And I remember in 1990, you know, when, you know, Packy Bonner saved the penalty and Dave O'Leary scored and everyone come out of their house and you're in this little green and everyone's celebrating, you know, just that, just, you know, Little Island of Ireland doing something great on a, on a world stage and I think that was the, the bug that bit me and it's infectious and I think I've had the privilege of experiencing that all along as a fan and especially as a player and an athlete and to see women's sport evolve and to start to see that now, the crowds building and everyone else getting that, the bug and the infection that, that brings all the values through sport is just, it's inspiring and it's electrifying and it's, yeah, we're in a good place. And that's why we all love it. Yep. Who were your sporting heroes growing up? Did you have any female role models? Not too many, if I'm honest. Obviously, the great Sonia Sullivan through Olympics. You know, my grandfather, who I just mentioned, was into athletics. He was into tennis as well. He used to come to our house, mind us, on the summers we were off. And uh, probably Martina Navratilova was one. Um, even though I wasn't necessarily into tennis, I loved, I loved, her, I loved her fight. I loved how she was there, she didn't take any crap really. I loved her headband, I loved her <laughs> aggression, I loved how she was kind of the female John McEnroe and I shouldn't be comparing her to a male, but because he was so up on a world stage for his personality and his aggression and what he brought to the tennis world and there she was doing the same. And I loved that she just didn't take any crap really, uh, regardless of her gender. And I think I just love that about her. Obviously, Sonia is our, our golden star who, who you know, set Irish sport to light, one of many great athletes at the time. But probably, you know, as I mentioned, Liverpool fan, Steve McMenamin, Robbie Fowler, um, Bruce Groveler, uh, Razor Ruddock, you know, all these male role models. And I didn't see them as anything different until I became, a, a, you know, an athlete in my own right and sort of seeing the disparity and I suppose the inequality. Um, I just seen them as players I wanted to aspire to, but not until I got on the bottom of that ladder did I see the difference and that I wasn't ever going to be given that pathway to be a professional footballer. But I loved what I seen, I loved the goal celebration. I'm sure I've been called an absolute idiot some of the times that I tried to emulate these when I scored goals or um, because I just, you just loved the sport and you loved achieving and you loved, I love winning, I love winning. Um, and that's what you wanted to do. So. It's sad for me to sit here and say, but it's also, we see the spread of variety of female names and athletes in different sports tonight being, you know, um, honoured as they should be. And I think that's the good place that we're in. So I've mentioned too that I had grown up, but, you know, the spread of athletes here tonight that have been absolutely set in the world of, of Irish sport alight is, is, is comforting. And, and you're definitely amongst those role models, Lindsay. Without a doubt, you're one of the most talented athletes this country has ever had and ever seen. But for you, playing a variety of sports growing up, was that important to you? And do you think you benefited from playing a variety of sports? Absolutely. I think probably one of the main... Um, 
facts of that is, you know, any uh, athlete that plays a variety of sports have a better chance to stay in sport as they grow up along. So especially as we talk about the dropout rate for female sports, I think the more uh, that female athletes play a variety of sports, the better chance they have in, in bringing it into their adult years, which is a huge positive. I think for me, it kind of, uh, I got to meet amazing people. I got to play an amazing sport. I got opportunity to play in Croke Park and I got opportunity to play in Twickenham. I got to actually experience the world of sport, you know, thoroughly. You were greedy for it. You wanted I it all. I was absolutely, <laughs> and I'm still greedy. If you ask me to go back there, I'd be gone. Because um, that's just the draw of it. You know, you always want to challenge yourself. And I suppose, you know, I'm flattered by the fact that you'd say I'm one of the talented, but I don't, to me, I'm just a sports fanatic. Mm who got lucky and got opportunity that I took. And I'm absolutely blessed with all the opportunities that I got. And to look back on it is, I can't believe it myself. And, you know, it's only when you return, you look back and the jerseys I've worn, the coaches I've had experience, the, the absolute amazing people that I've made lifelong friendships with, the values that we kind of sometimes are brandished around, around flippantly. Um, it's not until you step away that, and you actually bring them into your own personal life that you realize the values a lot more definitively. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think I'm a very, very privileged person as I sit in front of you, all thanks to the world of sport and all the people I've met. And I spoke to Olivia O'Toole there just before we come on stage and I remember seeing Olivia in awe on the telly playing for Ireland and not getting the accolade she deserved at the time um, and to see her here tonight and probably though when I was smaller, she definitely was one of the role models I had while I was playing on the same pitches or, you know, wishing she was on my team. Because you played with so many different communities and so many different organisations from a very young age, comparing the supports that were in place and I suppose the barriers that were there, did they vary? Was there one sport in particular that you felt that there was a clearer pathway? Um... I suppose, you know, we're probably going back. I started basketball, say, when I was 13. And, for example, Mark Ingle was my coach. He still coaches DCU Mercy now. And I remember, like, the big pinnacle time for Irish basketball is the Cup, which is January. And we don't get a lot of media coverage. We do now. But at the time, we didn't get media coverage until it was, until it was January. And, obviously, Rob has actually been involved. We, we found out through Neptune Basketball, which is huge down in Cork. And... Um, so you took that time and it was just, you loved that time of year. But I remember getting a call from a, a journalist and I kind of said to Mark, I can't take this call. Like, what am I going to talk to the chap about? And he said, Lindsay, you have to remember that A, you're representing the sport of basketball and B, you're, you know, you're representing your club and the female sport side of that sport. And you have to take opportunity while it's coming because it doesn't come, you know, often enough. And... You know, so we took that. And you, I've probably still stuck to that mantra all the way along, and you probably get more, you know, confident in it, and you know, you, your interest in it, and where you want female sport to go along. So you take the opportunity when it's coming. But basketball probably didn't have an awful lot. You know, we were very lucky to be under the umbrella of DCU, but there's other clubs who would have really struggled with hall time, getting a coach, getting players. Um, so I suppose looking back in the three, four sports that I played, probably soccer's in a really good space with, with grassroots. I think GAA has been huge in the investment of uh, Little. And I know um, without the money, without the sponsors, without the investment, without getting good coaches, without the visibility of role models, without seeing um, these amazing athletes on All-Ireland Day and being on the telly, um, you can't have that aggress investment from grassroots up because you just don't have the pool of players being attracted. So it's all cyclical how these all affect one another. So I think in the best place possible, it's probably GAA. And we're obviously working on the rugby side of things to probably from the top down, trying to get the pool of players increased. I think the barrier probably for women's rugby is because it's still probably culturally, it's very much seen as a masculine sport. And we're obviously trying to eliminate those barriers. It's very physical. We're obviously trying to get parents and um, even the players themselves on board to understand that it's a really technical and very safe sport. Um, but that's probably the little bit of a barrier that we're kind of trying to break. And it's, it, it's in its evolution, women's sport is slightly more behind, say, than ladies' football, for example, or camogie. So I think in the best possible light, I'd say GA is probably in the best, um, from my experience and what I see outside looking in, we're probably looking at GA being in a, in a good spot. But yeah, so... And basketball's had a hard hit, really, with the, with the pandemic over the last two years. Um, you know, we had the, um, the Michael Jordan... Uh, what were we saying, Cleanham, was the name of it? Oh, the dance. 
dance. The last, last dance, 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 which yeah. brought me way back to, the, you know, late 90, 1990s, early 2000s. Everyone was where, in the Nike Air Max. Listen, <laughs> I was like, I had them words, I had that jersey, and it brought so much nostalgia, but it actually, basketball should have fed off that and thrived, and then the yeah, pandemic yeah, yeah. hit, and really indoor sports mm -hmm. have been hugely, yeah. but we're back up and running, and, and hopefully it'll kick on from here, but um, I think all the sports are in a good place, but just at different levels in the revolution. Yeah, we'll come back to rugby in a while, but I want to come to you now, Rob. Espania, who is in the Raw, you're here tonight to give the male perspective for we'll you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get out of line here now, Rob. Your perspective growing up I, I read that you were told that you were too small, was it, to play Gaelic games. That was one challenge that you had, but did you find that there were barriers in your way to achieve what you have achieved on your sporting yeah, journey? Yeah, there was barriers in the sense where I came from, you know, like I came from a family where I was expected to, and I was following that path, do an apprenticeship when I was 16, my dad was a plasterer, all my family were plasterers and builders, so just that, that socio-demographic area where I came from, athletics and doing sport wasn't on the radar at all. And I was away doing an apprenticeship with my dad, and this can cross over with males and females, and I took a, a big growth spurt. I developed really late at 17 and went up and ran a cross-country race, and um, a Christian brother turned around to me and he said, your scholarship material. And just on that advice, or that encouragement, I left the apprenticeship I was doing, I went back to school and did my leaving cert and went to um, the North Man for a year, but I was couldn't believe, and then the environment I got into was other lads who were really ambitious, wanted to go, and it took me away from where I grew up, and I was exposed to fellas who were really, really good athletes, and I was like, I'm the same as them, good guys, like, and I ended up getting offered a running scholarship to America, but I qualified for the European Junior Championships race walking, and I went over there, and it just opened up my eyes again, and I think it, for 20 years that kept going, I just, every opportunity was always learning, always trying to get better, but my brother's a plaster no, and my sister works in a deli in Centra, you know, so sport gave me such a, a brilliant life. And, um, but, but when you bring it back to women's sport as well, I think the opportunities now, they're massive for women in sport, you know. Like when I grew up, like there was no way my sisters were going to do sport, it was never on the radar, you know. And even, even when I look at my wife Marion, like her brother played with Ireland growing up, her dad played for Ireland underage, her mum had trials for Ireland and when they got married, it was like, no, you're finished now playing football, your place is in the home. And Marion's brother John, who was the footballer, was the golden boy. And I knew from athletics, because there's really no inequality in athletics, like Marion was brilliant. I was, was just going to say, no. athletics is different. It's different, it is different. Um, and Mar would be out in the club with the lads and she'd be doing the circuits with us and I, and then I ended up doing all of the gym stuff for her because I was mad about her, like, you know what I mean? It just kind of <laughs> motivated me, like, um, so, but I could see just the advice and what she was exposed to and her being around me, that we bounced off each other and we grew, but it was her, she was the real talent in the house, you know, and her the brother... brother would be delighted to hear that. No, it's the truth, <laughs> he, he didn't, and it, the ego was so big for a footballer playing with Ireland underage and never came through and developed, whereas when Mar, Mar got her opportunities then, I remember being away at him, um, the World Championships in 2007 and seeing the other 400 meter girls, I was like, came home and I said, like, you're definitely as good as them, if not better, 100%. And then she came over to the Olympics and watched me, and I think it's very important, the environment that you're put into, and she seen the girls then in the flesh. I think it's really important to see the athletes visibly see. And she was like, I'm bigger than some of them and I'm stronger, I can be as fat. And then they became real and they weren't somebody in a magazine or on the telly and and then she made a massive jump. I got her, like, Stuart Hogg started coaching her from Scotland. And then Mars started going, like, indoors, outdoors, Olympic Games, World Championships. And, and then it was like, after a while, the allure that I had for her, like, was like, oh, no, Robin, she, you're just normal. You just work really hard. <laughs> That's it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> from being a father now of three girls and a boy, do you see the difference of how they're treated and the barriers that they face because they're all involved in sport? Yeah, um, definitely I see with, with gymnastics that Regan and Tara are in, that, that's equal. You know, the training's unbelievable, it's, it's savage, like, and the minute they recognise talent, they do move you up levels and they put you into tougher levels, and, like, Re Regan's only eight, she turned eight the other week, and I was, we were laughing about it earlier, like, obviously, Cahill went to AC Milan the other week, and I threw up a tweet and it hit over a million impressions. 
Regan trains harder than him and she's eight. Mm -hmm. So perception, uh, do you know, no, she does, she genuinely does, and she's re really, really good. Yeah. So, and it's back to getting that promotion and the investment and giving the opportunities. But I definitely think, no, I seen the football on the ground because my, my daughter Megan played with Ireland last year and she, pl she played with Cork City's first team last week. And the reality from what I've seen the last 10 years is that the men do have the best coaches, they do get the better opportunities, they do get the better pitches, and that there's a lower level of expectation with the, with the training, but it will get better. I think it is going to get better. I think with the huge numbers now, and I even see it in the girls' GA, it's really good, you know? I think it's better than when, where Megan was 10 years ago with Regan and Tara. I know it's, def it's becoming more normalised that the girls are there, and it's not, oh, girls going out and run around and have a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to challenge them as well and put barriers and carrots there and not get caught up in the levels, you know, it's like going, you know, the enjoyment in sport, it can be, it has to be fun, it has to be social, but I think the fun part is when you're developing and you're getting better. And like even Regan playing Camogie this morning, it was like going, oh, we lost, it doesn't matter who won, you know, you're, you're only learning the skills and you're after getting so much better in the last few weeks. It says you're after getting, and if you concentrate on just the development of the technique, and it doesn't matter if it's rugby or if it's race walking or if it's athletics, if you're learning the skills and the technique, it just becomes innate and natural then. But we're such a, our culture here compared to Europe, we're so um, obsessed and parochial. It's the GA, like, you know, mm -hmm. hating our parishes, and it's, it's it definitely like, you know, and because in Europe, being away training in Europe, you do your training, and it's one part of your life and the social side and family side is different. And it's like going, you, you do your work and then you get the reward for your work. Whereas we're all encompassing with it. Like, you know, it's like going, if I don't do well at sport, but I'm a bad person, you know, I'm depressed for a month and we're not going out if we lose. Do you know, and I think yeah. we've all gone through that. I've 100%. gone through it. So I remember getting disqualified in the Olympics in Athens and, you know, being down in my sister's mobile home in Yall and I'd go for two points over in the hotel, read the independent, to go to the beach crying, like, do you know what I mean? I'd be the same. <laughs> Don't come near me if we lost a final, <laughs> you know, and you're right. And I think the thing about the skill level, we spoke about this before we come on, is that'll have a knock-on effect, I think, with the dropout rate and the confidence, because the skill level, it'll just be second nature. Like, we wouldn't, com we wouldn't compromise on gender in school, so why do we compromise in the transition of... Um, or the transference of skill at, at sporting? And we shouldn't, and that really pisses me off, excuse the language, because you have to challenge, regardless of gender, kids want to be challenged yeah, on their own personal yeah. level. And that brings in then the emotional intelligence of the coach to be able to identify when to push Rob and yeah. maybe be a little bit softer. Liz, if you look at other international sports, women's sports, and they're brilliant, like, like yeah. I remember training in centres in Poland, like Olympic training centres, and you'd see the rugby girls, big strong girls, you know, pull your arms off. You know, you see the little gymnasts. Yep. You see all of the different body types. So there's sports out there for everyone. Absolutely. And, and like, you, I call my small ones up there, and they, they see no inequality in their head. Like, like they think, you know, they're as good as boys. And that's how better. it should be. Yeah. And, and, and it's all about, as you were saying, exposure and visibility and normalizing Normalizing it. it. Absolutely. And not pushing, pushing, normalizing it. And when it's there, like, I can't imagine, like, that Regan would think... Like, did she, I know she doesn't, because she thinks Marion's way better than me, and she just thinks I'm getting old and fat now and mocking me, can't even do cartwheels or roly-polies. I'm useless, like, you know? Um, so, yeah, it definitely needs to normalise women being well, and not, it's, it is normal. I have the opposite, actually, because obviously you've, well, you've, well, you've four children, but you've two, you've three daughters. Um, I have a son who actually said so we were passing the Aviva and he said oh mama what stadium is that and I said actually that's the Aviva and he said what sport do they play and I said rugby and he said what team plays there and I said Ireland and he said I've never been there to see and I was like no actually you haven't and he said who won't let you play in there I want to pume them and I was like <laughs> okay I'll, I'll bring you to see mean? them because Pume them like he wants to pume them. So they show that up there. Teach him that. Yeah. It's a Dublin thing anyway. It is a Dublin thing. Cork. Um, <laughs> But he asked all the questions for a six-year-old and he could not understand why because it's all I seen. play for yeah. Ireland mm -hmm. and I'm not playing in the Irish stadium. And I said, you know what, I might bring you along to have a conversation yeah. with Get him to Pume at the highest level. 100%. And he said to me in the car, I'll Pume at the highest level. Yeah, <laughs> come on to this committee meeting. But he said to me, um, I want to play, just randomly in the car last, last week, he said, Mama, I want to play rugby because you play rugby. 
and he was only about two or three and he, we were watching Leinster Munster and he said, oh, you're on the telly. He just couldn't, he was too small to get the concept that I wasn't on the telly, it was yeah, the boys. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that he could say, he didn't see anything, he just seen rugby, mm -hmm. I play rugby, that's it. So I probably have the positive side of the next generation with your yeah, kids and yeah. our kids, yeah, yeah, yeah. that they won't see any difference. Yeah. They mm -hmm. will value sport for what's in front of them, of regardless course. of anything. And that, that's a lovely And thing. it's also just, um, you know, when um, I have an 11 year old daughter and she, we were watching a match the other night and they were all men on the studio floor um, as pundits. And, she's, and uh, she looked at me and she said, what's going on there? Where are the women? Because she has now started to see that generally you'll have a female pundit mm -hmm. along with male pundits. And now she just, it looks not normal. So it is, it's about normalizing that you always have men and women talking about sport rather than it always just being men talking about sport. Mm. And when it comes to the role of the media, Kleena, we have come a long way, but when you look at the startling statistic that only 6% of sports media coverage goes to women, why is that? Why are men still spearheading that? And, and like that was the 2020 figure that it was 6% in Ireland and it's 4% worldwide is the UNESCO figure from 2018. And you know, you'd hope that that figure is much more after the incredible performances of Irish sports stars over the past year. But the reality is that it wouldn't be a hell of a lot more. And the worldwide, uh, really the figures haven't changed since the 1980s. So like it is really, really slow progress. So there needs to be some escalation on that. And we need to compel uh, media organizations and also uh, you know, it's, we're talk, um, uh, Liz, uh, Lindsay spoke about the, the sports ecosystem and the federations and brands and, and all of us have a part to play and, you know, budget is a huge part of it and where is the money going? But decision making is every bit as crucial as that. And, you know, within the media, um, you have, like, you know, the, every, the majority of people who get into the media have gotten into the media have gotten in because they know about men's sport and they are knowledgeable and, and also their experience and their um, is, is all men's sport and uh, the contacts that they have built up is around men's sport, generally team sports as well in this country, which is another reason why we have, like in other countries, um, in Sweden and a lot of the, um, the Scandinavian countries, the figures are much, much higher, but they would have far more focus on individual sports, which are, as Rob was saying, far e more equal as well. But I think, you know, just from my experience of working in the media, but also being chair of the European Broadcasting Union Women in Sport Expert Group, there's three key areas in it. And one is to prioritize it, and we have to compel media to prioritize it. But, and once you do, then the data is really critical. And like, we don't have enough data on how media organizations are doing. And once you start to gather the data, like for example, we started to gather data in RTE, and I presumed that horse racing would be in around 33%. Um, but actually when our exec uh, producer Ryan McCann started to count um, a women presence in our horse racing coverage, it was actually only between 8 and 9%. So it's really important to have the data and then you can start to address the data. And the third part is partnerships and collaboration because actually the federations and brands and uh, media do actually want to progress it and, and do want to cover more women's sports, but the systems and structures are kind of set up uh, with bias um, in it, and it is really hard to try and change that and, and, and proper systems and, and strategies. But real prioritization from leadership down is, is really critical to, to actually move it forward, and there's great opportunities for organizations who do that from leadership down, but from the grassroots mm. up is where it needs to start as well. And you're involved at committee level with your own club. Practically, what have you done to bring about equality? So um, I went in as um, a, a chair of an equality, diversity and inclusion um, a committee um, back in 2020. And so like having a position on the executive committee of a GA club speaking about um, issues for women like needing toilets, like periods, mm. and bringing those d discussions onto the committee room table, it's really critically mm. important for equality and for, for to talk about the fact that, you know, we've got to cater for everybody here, and then that turns into 
facilities, and it's like, well, what facilities do we have then that can actually proper ca properly cater for, for girls as well? Um, and uh, so really there needs to be that at every committee room table. So what we did as well was gender equality targets, and they led very strongly by our chair, Joe Davitt, and uh, we set targets on ourselves across participation, um, coaching, and our committee as well, and that was two years ago, and we are now at 60-40 in our committee, which I actually thought would be way harder to do, but everybody bought into it. And then, we, and coaching is the most challenging, but we're up to 29% in coaches, and uh, we have another year to go, and there's a huge push by lead, lead coaches to get it, because once you have targets, everybody aligns and pushes towards it. And then the third part of it was the exec uh, committee. And when we went out and spoke to women and said, well, we really would encourage you, and, and we are, we have got these gender equality targets, well then women started to, to put their hand up and realise, well we're welcome here actually, and they do actually want us to contribute. So I think targets and actually measurement are hugely mm -hmm. important in progressing and escalating the change that has been far too slow to move forward. Does the language around how women's sport is covered need to change as well? I know we need to distinguish, but we have ladies football, we have women's sport, but should it be, here's the soccer, and we give the, the results for male and female at the same time, or how do you, how do you address that? Yeah, um, absolutely, language is uh, hugely important because it um, propagates stereotypes and continues with uh, bias within society, and the media has a huge responsibility in that regard. And so, you know, quantitative is, is adding up the data, which um, is really important, but also then looking at how you're speaking about women's sport. And there was a really good study done by Cambridge University back in 2016 off the back of the Olympics, and what they found was there was more of a focus on aesthetic rather than athleticism for women than there was for male athletes. And also there was, a, uh, a, you know, they, they credited a lot men, uh, male coaches for female achievement. Mm -hmm. And then words that were used for women's sport were like strive and compete and participate versus dominate and mastermind for men's sport. So it was really interesting to see the, the difference in how women's sport was being portrayed versus men's sport. And that continues the negative and the, the bias that is there that makes women's sports lesser. And gender marking is another aspect of that, calling it the women's national team versus the national team, and hugely important to cut that out of our language because it is that men's sport is the norm. And, you know, likewise, you, 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 and you've seen federations actually mm -hmm. recently with the, the rugby and, and soccer as well, aligning it with men's World Cup and women's World Cup, and that's hugely important and, and progressive. But the media has a huge responsibility and education and awareness and calling it out when you see it. Mm -hmm. But creating the environment where calling it out is allowed and actually really wanted as well is hugely important. It actually has, uh, that has an impact on the, I found, uh, for me as an athlete, because I probably only got rid of the female athlete from saying, introducing myself, you know, I'm an be whatever, I'm a rugby player, I'm a female athlete, about maybe if it is even two years ago. So the language we use actually has an Im impact, I feel, well, it certainly did for me on how I valued myself mm -hmm. as an athlete in the overall sporting world, and that's not good enough because I labelled myself inferior to those of, of the male sporting world in a similar position. Um, and that's why I try and tell the younger athletes that you're always an athlete, you are a rugby player, you are a footballer. Don't put any label in front of that because then that makes us less. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we're here for, we're not less. Um, I think actually speaking of federation, I'm more than sure the French federation have dropped their, um, they call it sevens and fifteens now, but they don't call it men's and women's. Mm -hmm. So um, the French rugby federation have dropped that. And I think um, that's probably a question I have for you, if you don't mind. Do you feel the onus is on the, the say, unions to promote the inequality, or do you think it's on the clubs? Like, so you obviously set targets for your club. Do you think you just took that upon yourself, or do you think that say, it should be the hierarchy telling the clubs to set these minimum targets? Do you think that would help speed up? 
Well, yeah, I, I think that there's a huge, I suppose, um, in terms of GA, um, and there's a huge amount of discussion around it, and the GPA is pushing now for okay. merger, and I think that it's absolutely, our national games should be equal, and, um, and, and they should come together, but it needs to come together on an absolute level footing. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think it's going to be really challenging, because change is not easy. Like, we all want to retain the status quo, and this is a huge part of why we are where we are, still decades later with small percentage rises because power. you know it's it's so you will get a lot of fear when when change is around in any walk of, uh, in any in any business um, but what's hugely important is that vulnerability you know to to say that you know like particularly in in media for the boss to say i don't really know a whole lot about women's sport i need you to help me you know and because the majority of us don't know an awful lot about women's sports how could we because it's been invisible and you know and so by society seen as lesser value for far too long. So we need to show our vulnerability and ask questions, and that's how we'll all learn. But it also pushes people into being able to be um, honest and, and, and be able to ask the questions and to be able to propose new ways of doing things mm -hmm. as well. It's a huge part of how change might work, and, and it's a huge reason why change doesn't work. And a big part of it as well is people in sport, in general, their competence is around men's sport, and they have a fear that they're Going to become irrelevant as well and they might not vocalize that because they mightn't even realize it themselves when they're pushing against it yeah. but that's where you know a trusting environment is hugely important to try and create that change because it feels like women's sport and female athletes need to achieve above and beyond to get recognition they always have to achieve at the highest level we need to get to a point where everyday sport is being covered the small stories the big stories that it's not just the amazing stories, because that's that's all we're seeing at the moment. We're running out of time, but I, I, I would sit here all night listening to the three of you, but I'll come to you individually, one by one, and about what's next. What what do you want to see change? Where are we going from here now, Rob? I, I, I definitely feel, with, with the numbers and the participation numbers gone so high, let's give it a proper competitive pathway for the girls when they go, that they are treated like the boys, and that they do have the same opportunities, but let's bring the level up as well, the way they're coached, and let them know that they can be great. And I, I really think the mentality, and I see it on the ground in the kids, like the teenagers, the boys are at a really higher level in general. And then this, there's so, the small number of girls who, who excel are absolutely brilliant, but we need to get more of them up to that level, and we need the coaches there. They need to believe that they can, they, and, and that's half of the battle that, there's no excuses why they can't be fit, strong, fast. Because mm. obviously at the high level, we, we have brilliant, brilliant. There's probably no difference to my event in race walking. The numbers at the top, like, like I'd walk a marathon in under three hours, but then I could have a guy who's third in the nationals and he's full one hour behind me. And I suppose and also what you want to bring the depth and the level up and the higher level and give them a pathway. And when you do have the talented sports people that they'll go on to academies, they want to represent Cork or they go on to internationals and that there's pathways that they can go to England or Europe or America, you know, that there is that pathway there and the coaches are smart enough as well to hand them on and know what their role is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's how, how do we go about doing it, Lindsay? I think I'd like try to appeal to everybody who's in the sporting world to get people outside of it in. I think we need to look at ourselves and ask, what can you actually physically do to action change? I think we're fabulously gifted at talking about, you know, wanting to change, but until we action it, we won't see any change. Um, so if you make one promise to go to a, you know, a women's sporting event of a different, you know, if Rob's into athletics, then he might come to a rugby match. You know, I might go to a soccer match or a hockey match. Um, I've never been to because it'll open up my eyes to mm. questions. And that happened to me, imagine in sport, and I went to a camogie game a few years ago, a yep. senior game in Blackwell, and I go, oh man, I'm so ignorant. Like, I never realized that. But yeah, but you stood up and like, you said that. And I felt really, I was with Marion, like, yep. music. I, I, I felt a small bit ashamed. Like. But all of us and have a role for me to going play. Through, no, with my kids, all I, of us have a role to play. You know? And if I yeah. was to take, I, my rugby club is very good, but if I was to ask every club of every sport in Ireland to look at your female side of things and, and be honest and transparent and say, I want to action change within mm -hmm. this club, but I don't know how to do it. 
what resources can I get involved to make that change? And even if it's just a one small percent this year, it'll be 2% next year yeah. and we can kick on and we can again target set, we review. If you don't review, you don't know what's going wrong and then you can set new targets. It's exactly like being an athlete. We play a match, we review, we know what we did right, we know what we did wrong, we target set for the next one and we hope to win. As well to move forward. 100%. Like, you know, it can't be a devoid, it has to be, you know. No, everyone has to be pulling in the same direction and I think for a lot of things, grassroots to elite level, everyone has to be pulling in the same direction and communicating on what the left hand, telling the right hand what it's doing, you know. And strong leadership. Strong and leadership. Really strong leadership. And have we far to go, Cleanna, to reach that level of equality? Um, I, we're a very progressive nation, you know, we're seventh in the gender equality index. Uh, we're up there with the Scandinavian countries. So it's absolutely achievable, but it takes real commitment and it takes every single day prioritizing it and that's what like uh, um, over in Sweden um, in SVT in 2015 they were at 20 around 20 percent and they they decided that they wanted to be 50 percent and in 2020 they were 48 to 50 percent and they have maintained that sense but what the head of sport over there would say is every single day in every editorial meeting it's raised it's important and she said any day that it isn't it can drift back so it needs to be up there in priority, but like data is absolutely critical and we need to have more data to understand where we are. But I absolutely agree with what Lindsay's saying as well around, you know, all of us can actually uh, create mm -hmm. change in, in everything that we're doing. We can get involved in women's sport, you know, every click on the website tells an editor that you're interested in women's sport. So do it, you know, and like that you only have so much time in the day. Change, like I always follow the men's uh, GAA team in Cork, always the Gaelic football team, and it changed and I started to follow the women's, uh, uh, the ladies football team for Cork and the Camogie team and the women's uh, rugby team and the women's soccer team, because you, you only have so much time, mm -hmm. but it was like, I, I made an absolute change that I was brought up following men's sport mm -hmm. and that's why I'm so knowledgeable yeah, on men's David sport. Even Fitz going to the Cork Camogie, yeah. I think that's going out a bit of glamour. That's yeah. huge. And, I think, I think, and men, men in particular, can be mm -hmm. huge advocates for yeah. women's sport and have so much power as well yeah. to be able to change. It's about flicking get, that switch. Yeah, mm. yeah. flicking that switch. You and get her sport daughter, you should sponsor Rashida Adeleke and call out eight inter-county footballers and get her to race them over any distance as well. <laughs> and it'd be hugely powerful, like, do you know what yeah. I mean? Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> That's a brilliant note to finish on. Muwekas le Cleana le Lindsay Agus la Ra Bulabus more meets at Globe. <laughs>